Welcome to another episode of Hatching for Health, The Jessica Hatch Show. Tonight we are going to talk to a mother and her daughter about a condition known as crudishal. Now this is French and basically this is something that can affect every race, country, and gender. Um, and they even say one in every 36,000 children are born with it. So it is very rare, um, but we're going to learn about it um, right now. So thank you, Heather, and your daughter, Senya, for joining us. Hi. Hi. You guys are adorable. She's like a little mini me of you. So cute. Can you say hello, Sinya? And how old are you? How old are you? Can you show her with your hands? How old are you? Are you five? Oh, we're going to be shy now. <laughs> So well, tell us a little bit, this is something that, um, being as rare as it is, I know a lot of people that are tuning in are not aware of it. Um, so if you can kind of, in layman's terms, uh, tell us exactly what, you know, is the reason for this diagnosis. So basically, it's a chromosomal deletion. So, you know, every, everybody's got their chromosomes, and this is a part of the fifth chromosome is missing, and it's specifically on... Uh, the P arm, which is half of the chromosome. Okay. And so it causes a wide range. There's a big spectrum of abilities that are affected. Um, generally, you'll expect to have um, delays in pretty much every area of development to some extent. Um, some kids like Cinia are walking and talking and reading mm -hmm. and some adults will grow up and marry and have kids some will live with like independently but with support and then others will always need full support um it's really a very big spectrum a lot like a lot of other syndromes okay you can't, you can't really know how it's going to affect that's what you. i was gonna ask yeah because they they say that there's disorders that are considered like they have a classification of spectrums and so this is in fact one so where would you say that she falls in the spectrum from like a lower grade of it to a higher Cindy is definitely in a higher functioning category um, for her mm -hmm. age she's doing many things that kids her age aren't able to do and really? there she's even doing things that some adults with the syndrome aren't able to do um, so she's she's definitely on a higher level um, when you look at her across the the spectrum of her syndrome. Okay, and was this something that y'all were made aware of when she was born, or did y'all learn that she had it like in a you know year or two afterwards? No, she was actually 16 months old when she was diagnosed. Um, okay. When she was born, she had some troubles, but. Um, nobody was really concerned. They thought they were kind of little isolated things. And like, what were those some would... of those symptoms? So the first thing was um, that she was losing weight very quickly. Um, she couldn't eat enough, and she even like from a bottle, she wasn't eating very well, and therefore she wasn't gaining weight. Uh, mm. She was actually losing weight. So. Okay. And her, um, we were sent to an ENT for tongue and lip ties, which she did have. And then he noticed her breathing. Good, come sit with me. He noticed her breathing was very squeaky. She sounded a lot like a squeak toy. Um, and he, he, he said, hey, does she always sound like that? She was about two weeks old. And I said, yeah, every day. She sounded like it from the time she was born. And uh, he said, well, she has laryngomalacia. And he said, I'll talk to you about that again in about two weeks. I'll see you back. So okay. that was the beginning of our journey right there. Um, and it, it just kind of kept getting deeper from there. Goodness. So they say that this name, it came from, because it's like the sound of a, a cat's cry, right? The crew to shawl. It's like the cry of a cat, the sound of it. So when you say squeaky noise, is that what you're referring to? Kind of the noise she was making when she would cry? No, so actually, the one reason that she didn't get noticed right away is her laryngomalacia, which is common in pre de chat, and that's why they have the cat cry because their larynx is very underdeveloped, mm -hmm. and so they get that pitched cry. Hers okay. was so underdeveloped that 
she just squeaked. So she didn't have a mewing sound like a lot of the kids. She just squeaked. So we, that whole thought was missed at first. I see, which was kind of led them down a different path rather than diagnosing yeah. that. So it, it seems though like that's the main thing that they look for, you know, to diagnose. Is there, I mean, are they actually looking at the, you know, the larynx like, you know, through some type of imaging, like right after, at that point when they're having concerns that something might be wrong or how do they actually look and, and find out what the larynx looks like? Those and mm -hmm. the ENT, it has to be an ENT that does it and okay. they can see it instantly with the way the larynx is sitting and moving and its position, its construction. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was a simple thing. It's it isn't something they would necessarily do at birth if they so if they suspected cri du chat because um, unless they were having trouble breathing or eating, they probably wouldn't jump to the otoscope right away. Um, okay. But for us, that was one of the first things that we had done diagnostically, but we still didn't know the journey we were on at that time. Yeah. Is this a life-threatening condition or disorder? So thankfully for Cinia, it's not. Um, okay, great. She doesn't have a severe enough combination of related health issues that she is medically fragile in any way, but it can be life limiting. Sorry. Uh, okay. But we do have adults that grow into their 60s and 70s. Um, That's great. Generally, if a child, if somebody with pre chat is going to pass away as a direct result of the syndrome, it's because their other organs may also be underdeveloped. Okay. And that will typically happen within yes, the first no. year of life. She's very excited. You're Sorry, back. She's running. Yeah, you're um, you're running around, but we're not getting to see uh, enough of you. She wants to see you. So um, it's what? typically within the year of life due to either respiratory distress okay. or other failures. Okay. Is there just, I guess, physically looking? Because, um, you know, she doesn't, I wouldn't look at her and, and think anything, um, you know, outside is wrong. Is there any type of features, though, that are more pronounced um, when someone does have Kudusha? Yes. So they do tend to have a smaller head than normal. So now as an older toddler or preschooler, it doesn't look as small as it did. Um, but she never really had the chubby baby face because her head was okay. very small. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they don't tend to have a lot of body fat. So they kind of, they don't look like chubby babies generally. Okay. Um, and as they get older, their faces do tend to be longer and more slender. They have narrow jaw lines. Usually their bottom jaws are underdeveloped a lot of times. So they're, um, they'll be quite narrow through the bottom. Uh, right around their jaw um you know as much as she does resemble her daddy and i mm -hmm. when you look at other children with pre chat you can definitely see the resemblances between them um standing alone it's hard to point it out mm -hmm. but then when you see her with other people you'll see the commonalities kind of over and over again in the facial structure okay you kind of see some of those features differently so this i feel like a lot of um you know the information i read out there this is also known as the 5p syndrome which goes back to that chromosome number five missing a portion of you know of its top layer you know i kind of yes. they look at some of the visuals um so people do they more commonly talk about like 5p syndrome 5p syndrome or cruda shaw what do you hear more um it's a little bit tricky because technically you could have a 5P deletion and not have um, Cri du Chat. Cri du Chat has to have a specific part of that chromosome deleted and you could have another part of that chromosome but still have the part that has the trigger for 5P. Okay. So the 5P society that we are part of, they encompass all of it, but the vast majority of the children do have Cri du Chat, or adults. I mean, you know, the vast majority of people aligned with it are Cri du Chat. Is there, as far as the diagnosis timeline, what does that range look like? Is it um, commonly within like the first few years of life or do some people not get diagnosed until they're a teen? 
So most commonly, it is actually within the first few weeks that there's okay. either a solid diagnosis or a very highly suspected case and they're sent to genetics for confirmation. Um, it is becoming more common to be diagnosed during pregnancy. Um, there are a few of the screening tests that actually look for it now. Um, the ones that the mother can get, that's just the blood test before she would need to do like an amniocentesis or anything. This is okay. your fire trap. Um, and most often, typically, absolutely within the first few years, even if they're not diagnosed immediately, this is too noisy right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, we like your fire truck. Um, but there are a few people in our community that did not find out until their kids were diagnosed. And then the geneticist recommended specific testing for the parents. And then they found out that they also had the deletion. And they said, well, you know, I was always a little behind and a little uncoordinated and I struggled a little bit, but they never really had a, a label. So okay. it is possible diagnosed later, but it's definitely more common to be diagnosed within the first, definitely couple of months and almost always within the first Almost few always, years. yeah. Um, I got you. So, so Sinya, we're, well, we are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I, we're going to try and have a, a few questions answered by Sinya. And we're also going to talk about just what the medical uh, treatment looks like and whether or not this is something insurance covers. So that's always uh, something good to know. So we will take a quick commercial break and be right back with you. Imagine hearing the news as a parent that your child has been diagnosed with a condition that is degenerative or life-threatening. Now imagine being told that there's little to no research for the condition that even exists, making it difficult to try and figure out what to do next. The reality is that for so many rare conditions, finding specialists who understand the condition and being able to make informed treatment decisions for the child is very challenging. Each episode, I will help with my network of physicians and medical resources across the U.S. to attempt to connect the dots by bringing widespread recognition of rare conditions and connecting families to the best treatment, clinical experts, resources, and support. I'm going to highlight these hard-to-diagnose diseases and offer in-depth awareness for families of children in the rare disease community. I believe we are all in charge of our own health care. In pushing for answers and creating awareness, these various rare health conditions can make the world around us a better place. Not only am I a huge advocate who seeks to spearhead the fight to bring rare conditions to the forefront of research, but I personally had my own rare condition. In this rare condition, I was able to be cured of due to early detection. My passion to help others was fueled by that experience, and it has led me to start the Hatching for Health show. Now this show is a vehicle for us to create awareness to help these children find cures. Welcome back from the break. If you just tuned in, we are talking to Heather and her daughter, Senya about Cruda Shaw. Um, this is something that one in every 36,000 children are born with, and it's related to the chromosomes, specifically number five, and it not being fully developed. So um, we're trying to get with Senya and ask you a few questions. So Miss Senya, let me ask you, um, what is your favorite color? Pink, what is it pink? Okay. Are you are you in kindergarten or what what grade are you in? Pre-K. Do you like school? <laughs> you like learning? Yes. That's good. That's good. You you seem very active. <laughs> You like Paw Patrol? Yeah. Okay. We'll put on Paw Patrol later. Do you like art or are you more into sports? Do you like coloring? Do you like to color? Yeah. Yeah? Good. You What's seem like your you. Favorite sport to play? 
soccer. 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 <laughs> yeah, you you're bouncing around. You look like you have the energy to play soccer. So that's that would definitely be a good good sport for you. <laughs> Yeah. Hold on, hold on one second. Stay with us. Back back. The soccer ball is back in there. Okay. <laughs> Good. You'll have to you'll have to grab it for us while while I'm talking to mom and come show us your soccer ball. <laughs> uh, so tell us she... about her. Yeah, she probably will. She's like, okay. Um, the, the doctor visits you. So I know an ENT is part of y'all's diagnosis. Um, do y'all still see an ENT to look at, have a scope done? Does anything change with, you know, the larynx or is it just something that it developed the way it did and um, there's not really going to be improvement per se? So we do still see the ENT. They're one of several specialists we do still see um, on a typically six month basis with ENT and he actually recently did look at her um, larynx and her vocal cords uh, just to kind of see how we're doing okay. um, you know the the structure is affected but she's not in need of any intervention with it when she was five months old she did have um, a super super glottoplasty which is they basically they went in and took off some excess tissue from her larynx to kind of oh, okay. help her breathe better so she didn't have to work so hard to breathe and eat. Um, oh, that's, but that's, that's just one of the many specialists we still see. Yeah, so what are some of the other specialists outside of the ENTs? Uh, we see our GI every six months um, to monitor her weight. She was on specialized formula for a while to keep her calorie counts and her nutrition up. Uh, she's graduated from that now, but we still have to keep with them to monitor. And we see urology every year because kidneys can be affected. And so uh, thankfully we have not had that problem, but they do like to just monitor her every year. And we okay. see neurology as needed. Um, typically if something unusual is happening, we would check in with them. Okay. And what is, that's pretty um... much who we yeah, I know that that's a that's enough poor thing. That's a lot. Yeah, a lot of uh, visits to keep up with. So, going back to the GIs, um, is there certain or is there reasons why um, you know that's a necessary specialist to see? I mean, because um, I'm I'm still kind of only understanding this to be something that you know maybe affects you know what you look like a bit as well as the larynx. But you're saying now kind of the intestines and the the GI tract is affected. Yes, their growth in general is affected, so okay. um, sometimes they're not able to, for her, she, she wasn't able to physically eat enough, um, although we didn't have to do any tube feedings, your shoes are lovely, um, she, we didn't have to do any tube feedings with her, that's not uncommon. Um, we were able to give her a high calorie medical formula to keep her supplemented with what she could eat, but okay. it does affect their muscle tone overall and basically all of their body. So even like the muscles in her mouth get tired after a while. So oh, right. um, okay. she just may fatigue too much to eat a complete meal. Um, and then of course the muscles in their stomach and their intestinal tract don't necessarily work as quickly. So you know sometimes she might not digest food fast enough and so there's there's a lot of it adds up to a lot of little things yeah it sounds like it so it it's a lot more com you know complex than just kind of a diagnosis and you know kind of having a certain sound you know until you're done crying you know it, it goes into a lot more detail with really the entire you know um, body like all of the different systems that you know from what you can and can't eat to like you know keeping the weight on to just the, the strength of it all so it's essentially um it sounds like a condition that you're just kind of underdeveloped across the board like it's not any one area but rather um a lot of a lot of the entire system right yes it does um you know low muscle tone is one of the most common things um, and that just affects so much. That's a reason why some of our kids are very late to walk if they are able to walk. It's just a simple strength and coordination issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that affects their motor skills all across the, the board. 
Um, so they do tend to have delayed motor skills. Um, Senia was delayed, but um, again, she was still even on the earlier side for the Cri de Chat spectrum. So she was walking right before she turned two, which is definitely early. The average age yeah. is actually five and seven. Oh, wow, that's a long, yeah. That's, you know, very concerning if your child's not walking, you know, past two, really. I mean, most children, even if some are just a little bit delayed um, without any conditions by two, they're definitely walking. So um, it's good to hear she, you know, she's uh, already up and at it. Um, but I also heard there's, it doesn't sound like she had an issue, but where um, they actually have a tube for like feeding, where they're not getting enough nutrients on their own. So um, they're connected to, is it called like a GI tube or there's some type of specific there's, name? There's a few different types of tubes. There's a, a NG tube, which goes down the nose. There's a, what we call a G button, which goes directly into the stomach. And then there's also a JG, which bypasses the stomach and goes to the intestines. Um, okay. Thankfully, we've been able to avoid all of those with her, but they're, they are common, um, yeah. even if they're short term, especially in babies, if they just can't get the formula in. We were lucky to connect with the feeding therapist very young, mm -hmm. and thankfully she had enough strength that with the adaptations the therapist taught us, we were able to slowly feed her. Um, okay. Her in an area that we didn't risk that but it was close sometimes yeah so are you guys was, um in a position you know with insurance coverage is that something that y'all have any um, problems with or does your insurance you know through you or your husband is that covering all these these uh, visits and you know different things that she's having to do so we've been able to be on Medicaid for her. She qualified because Cri de Chat is an automatic qualifier for Social Security Disability. Okay. Um, and that provides her with Medicaid. So okay. we have been thankful to have that because that's yeah, really good. Insurance is very hard um, when you start. You know, even if they do cover everything, the amount of copays that add up every time you go to a specialist and every time you have a diagnostic test. And um, so, does which Medicaid help with lot. that? Yes, her Medicaid has covered everything her whole life. She was actually I was working when she was born, so she was on my insurance for the first two months until okay. I resigned because we couldn't figure out why she needed so much help and we knew yeah. I just needed to stay with her for a while. Um, and then we were able to get her on income based at the time before it transitioned to the disability based. Um, and, and because with newborns insurance really falls under the mom so it's mm -hmm. you know or the the mother the covered person yeah. um the deductibles were already met from having her okay but and so we admit our out-of-pocket but i know a lot of families struggle with that a lot of families struggle with making the the deductibles and making all the copays. yeah that, it's, it's quite a bit um there's a few things because we're, we're coming to an end here but um well, I, one thing, I know you have other children. Uh, do any of your other children have Crudishal or is that is it something that, you know, is genetic where it's passed from the mom and dad or is that not very common? So we do. We have two other children together and okay. Sunia's dad has been. He has an older daughter from his first marriage and she does have Crudishal. Oh, really? And she's almost 30. And in the time of our oldest, our oldest together is 17 and we gave the doctors the information and they're like, oh, that's random. And that's really almost 90% of all cases, it is random. Really? Um, so to no have two children, you know, yeah, and and okay. Our older two girls are not affected. Um, so of course, when it, you know, by that point we were very convinced it was random. And then we had Cynia and Again, she didn't hit a lot of those markers right away because some things weren't that bad and other things like her larynx was so underdeveloped that she squeaked instead of mewed. Yeah. Um, she just didn't hit anybody's red flags for it right of away. Course. So, uh, but her her oldest sister does live in another state with her mom. She did spend a lot of time with us uh, with custody when she was younger. She's amazing. She's also higher functioning. Okay. Um, and That's she's great. a great role. 
You have like a bit of a support system right, you know, right there in the family. Um, Speaking of support systems, are you guys connected with organizations or is is just having that, I guess, her stepsister um, in her life is probably a big deal and she's probably helped give some guidance. Yeah, we unfortunately don't get to see her stepsister very often because they live all the they actually live over in South Carolina. Okay. Um, so, and with her disability, she prefers to be at home and involved in her adult programs. So visits aren't very frequent, but um, we still take the knowledge. As far as organizations, though, the 5P Minus Society has been a blessing for us. Um, we connected with them probably the day that we got the diagnosis i reached i kind of you know went on and did what i've been doing through every other smaller diagnosis we've gotten to up until then and did a facebook search and then reached out and i connected with them and it's just called uh, like 5p network it's a 5p society society okay Mm -hmm. that's great so we'll (laughs) we'll have to get the exact um website there so we can we can post that during the episode and just throughout the week as we share your story with others um, I think it's a very important you know it's one thing to watch this and then you know you maybe hear something that um, is helpful but then to actually have a place to go to to fully engage and get more details um, and then I guess if you had any advice that you wanted to give other parents that have just learned their child was diagnosed um, with crudice what what would that be um medical literature is still very outdated so don't take what anybody tells you they can or cannot do um, because every one of our kids is different it doesn't matter where or how big their deletion is Um, you could meet another family that has a child with the exact same deletion and your children are very different um, just like every other kid is yeah so always expect that they can the the road might be long but we have kids learning to walk at eight and nine and ten years old so don't give up and um you know if you feel like a provider isn't listening to you and telling you they're just not gonna do it because they have pre and they can't give you another really good reason yeah um then you know get a new one honestly that's and that's the best i can tell you I because i've never- you know every that she can't because pre maybe because her muscle tone, maybe because the shape of her jaw. If they can't give me a legitimate reason, we don't have much reason to stay. There you go, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Heather, and your little girl, Sinia, for being a part of tonight's episode. And, and we'll, um, we'll share your story throughout the week. So when folks tune in next Tuesday, they'll get to learn even more and uh, connect with you. So thank you for being here, and we hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. You too. We appreciate the chance. Tell us in you. Bye. (laughs) I will. Thank you. Okay. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Hatching for Health. And we will see you right back here next Tuesday at 730.